last week I talked about how we were going to start a new series. I just didn't know what it was. Was it going to be Galatians? Was it going to be Ephesians? Was it going to be a series on marriage? Was it going to be a series on suffering? I've got a lot of requests for a series on Daniel and Revelation. And uh, we're going to do some big things next year. But, but this year, I just so enjoyed last week's sermon. And I got so much positive feedback from Psalm 73 that I thought, you know, over the course of the next few weeks, not making it some big series, but let's just spend some time in the Psalms in one of my very favorite books, and frankly, I'm embarrassed to say, a book that I almost never preach on. And so over the course of the next few weeks, we're just going to be in the Psalms, and today we're in Psalm 65, the God we can't live without. Um, I don't spend a lot of time listening to Sam Harris. By a raising of hands here today, who knows who Sam Harris is? Okay, just a few hands going up. Sam Harris is a well-known uh, atheist, and uh, not just a well-known atheist, but an avowed atheist, a passionate atheist, uh, very hostile toward religion of all kinds and all stripes. He is sometimes uh, regarded as one of the four most influential atheists in the modern world, sometimes called the four horsemen of the apocalypse, Daniel Dennett, Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, and Sam Harris. And so, um, predictably, unsurprisingly, as a Christian pastor, I don't spend a lot of time reading or listening to Sam Harris, but this last week, I made an exception. And uh, because I love watching TED Talks, I have a bit of an addiction to TED Talks, on one of the TED Talks that came up, it was a TED Talk by none other than uh, arch-atheist Sam Harris. And it was a TED Talk he was giving in Alberta, Canada. And the title of the talk caught my eye, and it might be a little bit difficult to read there, but in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, it says, can we build AI, artificial intelligence, without losing control over it? Right? And I don't know if you're aware, but AI right now, artificial intelligence, is, is very much a buzzword and has been for the last several years. And in this 15-minute long talk, uh, Harris suggests that, in fact, we cannot that we are incapable because we possess an inability to see a danger that is right in front of us, and we will continue to build smarter and smarter machines. Their computational powers are far in excess of our own computational powers, and it's just a matter of time. Harris thinks not very much time, not the far distant, you know, Buck Rogers in the 21st century science fiction future. He thinks in the not too distant future, we will have created machines and computers and programs that could actually be a danger to us and a threat to us. And I found the talk absolutely riveting and fascinating. There's no doubt he's a brilliant man, a neuroscientist, hugely intelligent man. But what I found most interesting was his closing line. And this is literally the line that closes the entire TED Talk. And just after he says this line, uh, it, almost at, at once, the auditorium there in Banff, Alberta, stands to their feet in uproarious, thunderous, uh, standing ovation applause. And this was the line that elicited that final moment of applause. Harris says, we have to admit that we are in the process with AI of building some sort of God. And now would be a good time to make sure it's a God we can live with. We need to be clear that we are on the verge of building a grand super intelligence that Harris and others believe will absolutely, not could be, not might be, not potentially, will be a threat to human beings and to civilization as we know it. Well, with that kind of in mind, and I'm going to return to Harris at the end of the talk, I want to talk about the God that we might be making, as Harris suggests with artificial intelligence, and the God that is described in Scripture, the actual God, not a lower G God, but a capital G God. And we're going to be in Psalm 65 today. So if you've got your Bible open to Psalm 65, we were in 73 last week. This week, Psalm 65. And uh, in Psalm 65, made up of just 13 verses, we're going to find that there are three reasons that we are called upon, that believers in God are called upon to give thanks, right? This is a, I love this season. You know, down here in Australia, you kind of lose wind of it as an American, but it's great to have Sarah here and a few other uh, Americans. And this year, we're going to have Thanksgiving. And I'm looking forward to having Thanksgiving, which is really a, a great excuse to get together and eat too much food and watch the Dallas Cowboys play football, right? So, so Thanksgiving is coming up, but, but this is a little different Thanksgiving. This is the Thanksgiving that those that are followers of God have. And in the psalm, the psalmist says, in this case David, last week was Asaph, there are three reasons that we should be super thankful to the God, the capital G God, 
The first reason is he is the redeemer, and we'll read that in the first four verses. The second reason is he is the creator. We'll read that in the second four verses. And then finally, this God is the provider. Uh, I went back across a book that I started reading years ago by one of my favorite authors, N.T. Wright. He wrote a book, a shortish book, called The Case for the Psalms, Why They Are Essential. And I just went back and didn't read the whole book, but I read the things that I had highlighted in the book and came across this, and I thought I'd share it with you. Wright says, I'm not simply writing to say, hey, these are important songs, these psalms, that we should try to understand. That is true, says Wright, but it puts the emphasis the wrong way around, as though the psalms are the problem and we should try to fit them into our world. Actually, again and again, it is we, muddled and puzzled and half-believing, who are the problem. And then this line, and the question is more, how can... How can we find our way into their world, into the world of the Psalms? A little bit later in the book, Wright goes on to call uh, this idea a psalm-shaped world. A psalm-shaped world. What does that mean, a psalm-shaped world? Well, for Wright, and I'm suggesting here for the psalmist himself, a psalm-shaped world is a world in which and we're going to unpack this in great detail today, the decisions that we make and the attitude that we have and the praise that we render is all seen through a lens. And that lens is the lens of praise, the lens of joy, and the lens of God's amazing goodness and power, a psalm-shaped world. A psalm-shaped world is not oriented toward oneself. A psalm-shaped world is not oriented introspectively. A psalm-shaped world is oriented toward God. The theologians would say that a psalm-shaped world would be theocentric. This is one of the major facets of Scripture itself, that Scripture is theocentric, that, that God is at the center of Scripture. And all you have to do is read one or two or three of the psalms, and you will quickly become aware that at the heart of the psalms, these ancient songs, these ancient Jewish songs, God is at the center. God is the point. This is what we mean when we talk about a psalm-shaped world. A world where the great you, that is God, is the center of all of our life and our praise. You and I, as readers of the psalms, we can conceive and create this world in our own lives. We can create psalm-shaped worlds in our families, in our neighborhoods, and in our spheres of influence. Today, I want to talk to you, based on Psalm 65, how to create a psalm-shaped world. A psalm-shaped world is going to be made possible only by what we might call a psalm-shaped worldview. By a raising of hands, how many here know what that word means? You've heard that word before, a worldview. Raise your hand. Okay, not as many as I would have maybe thought, but the word worldview is just exactly what it sounds like. The way that you view the world is your worldview, and there are lots of worldviews on offer today. There's the atheistic worldview that... Uh, Harris subscribes to, materialistic worldview that Harris subscribes to. There's the fundamental Islamic worldview. There is the scientism worldview. There is the Christian worldview. There is the Hindu worldview. There is the New Age worldview. There is the social justice worldview. It's just the way that you personally, idiosyncratically view the world or your corporate group views the world. I'm suggesting that many of us have what we might call a kind of church worldview or a kind of corporate church perspective. But I'm going to invite us, and I think the psalm today is going to invite us to have a psalm-shaped worldview, to view the world, those around us, our family members, our friends, our jobs, our money, our recreations, our resources, nature itself, through the lens of the great center that is God and of the praise that flows out to him. A worldview is not the thing you see, like the glasses that I'm wearing here today, it's what you see through. So in order to arrive at a psalm-shaped world, I'm suggesting that we're going to need a psalm-shaped worldview. How many here have heard of the band, actually an Australian band, called the Sons of Korah? Anybody here heard of the Sons of Korah? Anybody here a fan of the Sons of Korah? I'm a big fan of the Sons of Korah. Glad to see you. Me too. I'm just like that guy. Both hands up. Um, I was exposed to the Sons of Korah probably 15 years ago, and if I'm not mistaken, the lead uh, songwriter and musician is a fellow by the name of Matthew Jacoby. And uh, I've actually exchanged some emails with him over the years and been to see them in concerts a few times, even tried to arrange a couple concerts for them in the United States. And uh, one of the things I love about the Sons of Korah is not just their music, which I do very much enjoy, but the fact that all they sing are the Psalms. 
right? They don't have their own personal lyrics. Their, their, their first album had a few of their own songs, but every subsequent album, they just sing the Psalms. And the songs are just titled Psalm 14, Psalm 36, Psalm 65, Psalm 73. And whenever a new Sons of Korah album comes out, I get a little giddy, and I'll tell you why. Because I love the way that Matthew Jacoby and the others in the Sons of Korah interpret the Psalms. Because what they're doing when we read the Psalms, we're often reading something that's flat on a page. It, it feels like it just feels like prose almost. It's a poem. And it's not just a poem. It's a song. And, and in the particular psalms in which David is crying out in the so-called imprecatory psalms, you might imagine the sons of Korah give that a more aggressive and, and rhythmic feel. And in the psalms that are more celebratory and, and uh, the, the psalms that have relief, the, the, the psalm has a more melodic feel. And I've really appreciated how the sons of Korah have been instrumental in my own walk with Jesus in giving me a psalm-shaped view of the world. If you are not familiar with the music and the ministry of Sons of Korah, a lovely Australian band, I would invite you to, be, to become familiar with them. Download one of their albums. A good album to start with is an album called Shelter. Download the album, purchase the album, listen to that album, and see if Psalm 51 doesn't come alive as perhaps it never had before. Because you're not reading the writings of an essay or the writings of an article. You're, you're reading songs. These are songs that David composed and Asaph composed and the sons of Korah, that is the ancient sons of Korah, composed. Let's go now to Psalm 65 and just read it through as we did last week with Psalm 73. Let's just read it through in its entirety. And I want you to look for those three elements there. God is redeemer and God is creator. And then finally closing with God is provider. Okay, pay attention to that. Here we go. Psalm 65, beginning in verse 1. Once again, this week I'm reading from the New International Version. Praise awaits you, our God in Zion. To you our vows will be fulfilled. You who answer prayer, to you we will come. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. Blessed are those you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. You answer us with awesome and righteous deeds, O God, our Savior. The hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas who formed the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength, who stilled the roaring of the seas, the roaring of the waves, and the turmoil of the nations. The whole world is filled with awe at your wonders. Where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. You care for the land and water it. You enrich it abundantly. The streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with grain, for so you have ordained it. For you drench its furrows and level its ridges. You soften it with showers and bless its crops. You crown the year with your bounty, and your carts overflow with abundance. The grasslands of the wilderness overflow. The hills are clothed with gladness. The meadows are covered with flocks, and the valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for joy and sing. That is an invitation to have a psalm-shaped worldview. To make your personal world, the world that you live in, your address, whatever that address is, your house. To make your flat, your house. To make it a psalm-shaped house. To make your checkbook a psalm-shaped checkbook. To make your life a psalm-shaped life. To make your recreation a psalm-shaped recreation. To make your church attendance a psalm-shaped church attendance. This is an invitation to see God as redeemer, creator, and provider. Let's walk through this because as we mentioned last week, if you read through the Psalms in a cursory or a perfunctory way, you're going to miss it. But if you'll just take a moment, if you'll pause, if, if you'll go through a little more slowly and a little more methodically, and I've been doing that this week with this psalm because I decided early this week I was going to do Psalm 65. I didn't want to wait as I did last week until the last minute. I've been thinking about Psalm 65 all week and trying to invite Psalm 65 to shape my view of the world, to shape my view of some really bad news that I got this week and to shape my view of some really good news that I got this week and to shape my view of the future and of the past and of my present. How can we do that? How can we do that? Well, the first thing you have to notice is that it's not just God as redeemer or as creator or as provider, but in every case in the psalm, the underlying subtext of the psalm is that God is powerful. That, that God is not little g God, he's big g God, he's the one true creator God. And so this is a psalm of God's redemptive power, his creative power, and of his power to provide. 
He is not a mere regional deity, one among many. No, this is the one true creator God, the God that struck up a covenant promise with Abraham. God invites us into a psalm-shaped world where he is at the center and we sing praise and joy to him. Let's go through it now, verse by verse. Psalm 65, verse 1 says, Praise awaits you, our God in Zion. To you, our vows will be fulfilled. Some of you are going to get sick and tired of me saying this, but I'm going to say it again. One of my critiques, both of modern praise songs and of some of the old hymns, is that they are always, not always, very often in the personal singular, me and my and mine. And I cannot for the life of me understand why we would come together in a corporate setting with several hundred of us here and sing psalms about me and my and mine. The psalms are often written for a corporate worship setting, and the best worship songs, in my opinion, are songs about we and us and our. If we come across one of those modern-day songs that, that has a, a singular me, my, mine, I personally always just substitute we, us, and our, because I'm here with my brothers and sisters. Can you say Amen. You're here with a church. You're here with your family. You're here with your people. And I love that. Praise awaits you, not my God, our God in Zion. To you, our collective, corporate, plural vows will be fulfilled. God is primarily a giver, but he can also receive. A year and a half ago, I read this very scholarly book, an outstanding book by John Peckham titled The Love of God, A Canonical Model. It's a book that is not easy to read, not easy to understand, but for those that are willing to put in the time, energy, and effort, the theological content and the, the thought content of this book is literally beyond mind-blowing. Absolutely amazing. In fact, he's just released a brand new book that I'm super excited about. I've already read it, but I'm super excited about having the actual... I, I read the pre-publication version. Now I can't wait to have the copy in my hand. I'm really into books, as you might have guessed. One of the things that Dr. Peckham describes in The Love of God is what he calls the bilateral view of the love of God. Bilateral as opposed to unilateral. He, in other places, calls it the reciprocal nature of the love of God. Now, let me translate all of that theolo theological speak to you. What he says is, we often conceive, and certain stripes of Christianity conceive, of God's love being only unidirectional, only unilateral. Love flows, flows from God, love flows out from him, but God cannot receive love because in order to receive something, it would suggest that he was somehow imperfect, that he somehow needed something. Oh, Dr. Pekka makes a profound case that God, while he is primarily a giver, he is also capable, even in his godness, even in his divinity, of receiving. And the psalmist begins by saying, God, praise is waiting for you. When you show up, there's going to be praise, there's going to be songs, there's going to be thanksgiving. Praise is waiting for you. And you get the sense that on the other end of that psalmic equation, God is pleased with the praise that awaits him. He can't wait to hear that praise. And we're going to get to the nature of that praise here in just a moment. I like this from the poet laureate of the United Kingdom from 1930 until his death in 1967. John Massfield says, God warms his heart. God warms his hands at man's heart when he prays. That is, that's bilateral there. That's that love goes and is given and is received. It's not just that it flows from him, which of course it does, but God can also warm his hands at the heart of man when man prays. What a beautiful poetic description of how praise awaits God in Zion among his people. God is waiting on your praise. God is waiting on your praise. God is waiting on your thanksgiving. God is waiting on your song. God is waiting on you to rejoice. And he's waiting there. Just get that, that poetic picture in your mind. He's waiting there with slightly chilled hands because when you sing, when you praise, when you pray, it's a warmth that is made available to God that I cannot satisfy. It's a warmth made available that Carolyn cannot satisfy or Lance cannot satisfy for somebody else. When, when I pray, it's something that is marked by my uniqueness, my individuality, the person that I am, as is Carolyn's, as is Lance's, as is anybody's. But if you're not praying and you're not praising, if your world is not a psalm-shaped world, God comes, as it were, to the fire of your heart, looking to have his own hands warmed, and there is nothing there but, but wood and perhaps kindling, maybe even a little smoke, but no warmth. No warmth. Ellen White, Ministry of Healing, taps into this very idea. Every individual has a life distinct from all others. 
and an experience differing essentially from theirs, God desires that our praises shall ascend to him, notice what I've underlined here, marked with our own, what's that word? Individuality. Individuality. Now I want you to notice the, the, the word there. God desires. God wants to warm his hands at your praise. And if I'm praising God, and if, if Judith is praising God, and if Ruth is praising God, but, forgive me, Elizabeth, if Elizabeth is not praising God, right, just forgive me here, Elizabeth, for a moment, if the three of us are praising God, God receives that praise from David, God receives that praise from Judith, he receives that praise from Ruth, but when he comes, when he comes to Elizabeth in this case, of course it's fictitious because she loves to praise God, when he comes to Elizabeth, all of my singing, all of my praise, all of my thanksgiving in Judas and Ruth cannot be the same sound, the same melody, the same warmth in the ears of God and at the hands of God that Elizabeth's praise alone could bring. You sometimes might be tempted to think, well, there's plenty of people singing. There's plenty of people in this room that are praying. I don't have to sing. I, oh no. God wants to warm his hands at your heart. God wants to put his hands down to not only give, but to receive. Praise awaits you, oh God in Zion. The psalmist says, man, we can't wait to render individual and corporate praise to our amazing God. And when that praise ascends, it will be marked, it will be stamped, it will be patented with my unique personality and individuality. Don't rob God of the warmth that you alone can give. Don't sit there surly-faced and quiet. No, sing to God. Sing and make a joyful noise. Verse 2, you who answer prayer, to you all people will come. Well, one thing we can be absolutely certain of is that Jesus lived in a psalm-shaped world. Jesus lived in a psalm-shaped world. Paul lived in a psalm-shaped world. In fact, you can make a case that the most popular book for every New Testament writer to quote, including Jesus himself, was the book of Psalms. They lived in a psalm-shaped world, and, and this is strongly suggested here when, when the psalmist says, to you, everybody will come. Well, that sounds just like Jesus in John chapter 12, verse 32. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw what? I will draw all peoples to myself. Jesus lived in a psalm-shaped world where God was not just the God of the Jews, not just the God of the people that look like us, think like us, talk like us, act like us, eat like us. God is the God of the whole world. This is one of the reasons that people like Harris and others that have inclined themselves away from God and toward atheism, because so many versions of God sound so paro parochial, they sound so insular, they sound so in-house. But the God of Scripture is a God of the whole world. He's a God of Jew and Gentile both. All peoples will be drawn to him. When John the Revelator saw what the redeemed would look like in the courts of heaven, it wasn't just a bunch of same-looking, same-talking, same-thinking people. These were, this was a diverse multitude, and he communicates that diversity here in Revelation 7, verses 9 and 10. After these things I looked, to behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all, of all, of all, and of all, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. What John saw in heaven was a diverse, praising multitude, lots of different people from lots of different cultures. Yes, praise awaits you in Zion. Praise awaits you in the church. But God has his people everywhere. Can somebody say amen? And they don't all look like you, talk like you, act like you, think like you, and speak like you. I love this from Hans K. Rondell's book, Deliverance in the Psalms. Mankind's need for worship is in principle fulfilled when he begins to thank God. Hang on to this. We're going to talk now about thankfulness. It is not enough to consent that there must be something in the universe, some ground of being, some force of good out there. No, he says, only when God becomes our personal God do we relate to him in a proper way? Gratitude should not just be one motive among others in our life. It ought to be the controlling motivation. I want to say that again. La Rondell is saying gratitude should be the controlling motivation in your life. Gratitude, thankfulness, appreciation, thanksgiving should be the controlling narrative of your life. To be thankful, a psalm-shaped world is a world in which 
Thankfulness is the primary modus operandi of your heart and of your life. An attitude of gratitude, as has been said. A psalm-shaped worldview is one in which you see all around you in the songs of the birds and in your own, as Mel was alluding to, your own fan fantastically complicated physiological processes that sustain you from moment to moment. Everything around you is an opportunity to be thankful. The person that's sitting next to you, the, 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 the food that we're going to eat soon after this, the beautiful music that we just sung, the opportunity to write a check uh, for the uh, Conflict Beautiful series that we just talked about, all of these are opportunities to be thankful. Praise awaits you, O God in Zion, which I suppose brings us to a question that at some level we all have to answer and, and ask, and that is, what drives you? Yeah, for many of us, we're driven by a sense of accomplishment. We're driven to get out of bed because we need to earn more money and we need to have a sense of you know, financial accomplishment or professional accomplishment or academic accomplishment. Or in some cases, people are driven by social media and they want more followers and, and uh, they, they want to uh, have more people that you know, listen to them in their various platforms. I don't know. I don't know what it is that drives you, but I can tell you this. The thing that draws us more than drives us is God and his goodness. God can drive. There are times and instances and situations in which God appropriately motivates us with fear. But God's primary motivation is not to drive with fear, but to draw with his goodness, to draw with his love, to draw with his forgiveness and grace. What is it that drives us? What is it that draws us? Do we have an attitude of gratitude? Do we have a psalm-shaped world? Last week, we talked about Asaph, who entered the sanctuary plagued by doubts and came out singing for joy. Let's just remind ourselves of that. What was it that happened? What happened to Asaph when he went into the sanctuary? We read that verse last week. Let's read it again. Psalm 73, verses 25 and 28. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. That's a very theocentric world. That's a very psalm-shaped world, Asaph. But as for me, he says, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. And we talked about this last week. That personal connection, that personal relationship, it wasn't so much a what that happened to Asaph in the sanctuary. It was a who that he encountered. He encountered God in the sanctuary. And when he encountered God, he's like, man, I get it. You're God you're amazing, and I just want my life to be an outflowing of praise as the, the birds in their melodious songs and, and the ocean in its changing tides and glorious waves. I just want my life to be an outflowing of uninterrupted praise to you. I'm going to get to a point a little bit later that is fascinating on that. Psalm 65, verse 4, just like Asaph, he longs to be near God, David does. Look at this. Blessed are those who you choose and bring near. There's that same language. Bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. Why was Asaph so excited about the temple? Why is David here so excited about the temple? Well, the obvious reason is that the temple is where God was. And if you wanted to be proximate to God, if you wanted to be close to God, when God in the Old Testament was federalized, when he was localized, you went to the place where God was. But, but since Jesus has come, and since he has sent the Holy Spirit, the, what we might call the defederalization of the presence of God has taken place. The defederalization of the presence of God has taken place. You say, what does that mean? That sounds fancy talk. The defederalization of the presence of God is this idea that God is not just located in a temple. He's not just located in one location. You are the temple. Jesus was mobile. He could go from Jericho to Jerusalem, from here to there. Jesus could wind his way in and around because the, 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 the sanctuary became mobile. Right? The, 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 the ancient sanctuary was located in a place and in a spot where you had to go to and now you don't go to the sanctuary, the sanctuary, you are the sanctuary. God, in, in his wonderful, illimitable way, comes to us and inside of every one of us. Your holy temple. Verses 3 and 5, I just put these together. I purposely just sort of clipped out verse 4 so you could feel the strength of this just in its natural flow. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. You answer us with awesome and righteous deeds. God, our Savior the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. I want you to look at what I've underlined for you there. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. Is there anyone in this room who has ever been overwhelmed by sins? Okay, that's the honest people and the rest of you that are being Australian. 
right? Being lazy, being lazy, being non-participating. Every one of you in this room have in some sense been overwhelmed by sins. You did something you shouldn't have done. You said something you shouldn't have said. You, you got caught in a lie. You, you got caught looking at a website you shouldn't have been looking at. You got caught spending your money on something you shouldn't have said. You were overwhelmed. You, you, you got caught. And you were overwhelmed. You, you had the shame of guilt rush upon you. The, the flush of, of, of guilt and of shame went up your neck and, and you were paralyzed by sin. Not just the sin itself, but by the knowledge that people knew you were a sinner. Isn't that crazy? All of us are sinners, and yet we get paralyzed when people find out that we're sinners. And the psalmist cries out and says, when we were overwhelmed by sins, not just that when we were aware of sins, not that when we admitted academically that we have occasionally sinned last Thursday, one time, barely. No, when we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Last week, we said that God can handle your questions, your confusion, and your frustration. But I want to tell you this week, God can also handle your sin and your guilt. God is big enough to handle your sin and your guilt. Listen to the words of Dr. La Rundell in Deliverance in the Psalms. The most fundamental need of man is a religious one. The thirst of the soul for God. We cannot truly enjoy the things of this world as long as our hearts are filled with anxieties and we are burdened with the weight of guilt. All of this great praise and all of this great joy we see in the psalm, it will, just, it will be as brass to you. It will be as nothing to you if you if you're feel that you are unforgiven and your soul is filled with guilt and shame. He continues, before we can be free to rejoice in the bounties of earth, our sin-sick souls need to be healed with the balm of heaven. Thank you, Jesus. The deepest motive for our praise of God is therefore God's atoning grace received in our hearts. The deepest motive, before we can appreciate the God of creation, we have to begin with the God of redemption. We have to know our shame is taken away, our sin is taken away, our guilt is taken away, that God can deal with our transgressions and our sins when we are overwhelmed. God does not help us merely when we help ourselves. God helps us most of all when we are drowning in sin, when guilt overwhelms us because we have lost in the battle of life. And I know we spend most of our time pretending like we're not losing in the battle of life and we've got our act perfectly together and, you know, we put our best face on and we put our best pictures up and all of that for social media and every other kind of presentation. Even in the pre-social media world, we always put on our best face, put your best face forward. Try. We all kind of act, you know, corporately, like we've kind of got it all basically together. And yet God looks down and he says, I know that many of you are drowning in sorrow, you're drowning in sin, you're drowning in guilt, you're drowning in shame. And God, is that's when he's most available. That's when you need a God. When guilt overwhelms us because we have lost in the battle of life. The Instagrams doesn't tell the whole story, neither does Facebook. We need to remember that God has now atoned for our transgression and the gift of his son. Our sins are too much for us to cope with. Can somebody say amen? But God can handle our sins. They do not overwhelm him and they are not too strong for him. God can handle your questions and your concerns and your confusions, and God can handle your sin and your guilt and your shame. Give it to him. Praise awaits you, O God, in Zion. You'll notice how here in Psalm, uh, in, in Psalm 63, verse 5, we're turning the corner from salvation to creation. You answer us with awesome and righteous deeds, God, our Savior. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, very New Testament, very psalm-shaped world here. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. Can somebody say amen? Man, you, Jesus is big enough. His shoulders are broad enough to bear even your sin, even your shame, even your guilt, even your sense of drowning in inadequacy and in transgression. Jesus is big enough to save you. So Psalm 63, verse 5, we see the transition here now to God as creator. The hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 29 the Apostle Paul says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. 
Why are we one in Christ Jesus? Because this is a fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, descendants, and heirs according to the promise. So when the psalmist says there in verse 5 that the ends of the earth and the farthest isles will come to you for forgiveness and for healing, this is a part of the fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise that God never had a parochial, insular, us versus them mentality. God's view was always universal. God's view is always to save everybody, not just to give his tooth, truth to, but to give his truth through Abraham and his descendants. And so the God of redemptive power. Then verses 5 to 8, we come to the God of creative power, which those of us that are Sabbath keepers, those, that, those of us that are passionate about creation, we, we might think we'd be tuned into this. And I suppose to some degree we are. Let's read through that. You, the last part there, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, who formed the mountains by your power, there's power, having armed yourself with strength, who stilled the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the turmoil of the nations. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders, where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. And I appreciated the morning has broken as well as one of our songs today. I want to give a big shout out to Tim Higgins, one of our church members here today, who reminded me last week that today would be the Sabbath just before Remembrance Day, right? 11-11. 100 years ago on 11-11 at 11 o'clock, millions laid down their guns and World War I ended. That's something you can say amen about, friends. But I want to say this, and, and I'm going to set this up in a context of thankfulness to God as creator. I mentioned earlier we'd come back to this point, and this is the point. N.T. Wright says it this way in his book, The Case for the Psalms, Why They Are Essential. Only humans, it seems, have the capacity to live as something other than what they are. Just let that settle in. Human beings can take up guns and shoot other human beings. Kill other human beings, whether it's in the name of nationalism or the name of uh, expansion of territory, in the name of freedom... But, but people can pick up guns and shoot other people, put, bring an end to other people. God didn't create us to kill. God created us to make life. If you go back and look in Genesis 1 and 2, what does it say there? Be fruitful and multiply. That sin that was committed there in Genesis 4 with the taking of life uh, by Cain of Abel, that, that was a violation of God's creational intent and God's creational purpose. A hundred years ago, today, tomorrow, a bunch of people, perhaps not for theological reasons, but, but nonetheless, they actually came into closer proximity to God's creational intent for them, where they stopped saying, you know, I'm here to take life. And I'm not getting into the politics of World War I, World War II, or any subsequent war. We're going to have wars on a planet where people are broken and, and systems are faulty uh, from the time of Jesus until the present. That's, that's, there's no question about that, but the point is this. Birds are birds and trees are trees. He goes on to say trees behave as trees and rocks behave as rocks and the sea is and does what the sea is and does. And the psalmist look out on all of it and see it as a great shout of praise to the God who has made it to be so and to flourish. But human beings, he says, human beings are seemingly, singularly, peculiarly, if that's the right word, capable of actually not fulfilling our creational intent. We're the only ones who can say, I'm an image bearer, I'm made in the image of God, and I'm not going to fulfill God's creational intent in my life. We can elect to do that, and war is only one way that we elect to do that. Now, we have so much to be thankful for that we are living here in the wake of the armistice, in the wake of Remembrance Day, and it is a beautiful thing to celebrate and to be mindful of, but what we're celebrating is the end of a war, a war that was going to start up a couple decades later anyway. And a war that we are even now teetering on the verge of, it appears that the only thing that keeps us from teetering off into a third conflagration is everybody's, you know, corporate and collective terror about what would happen if we used nuclear war uh, weapons or if we used weapons of mass destruction. So the thing now that is keeping us basically civil is not that we figured out that civility is the way forward and we should fulfill our God-given destiny to be image bearers. It's because we're all terrified of what will happen if we have another kind of war. Because the weaponry now has become so sophisticated and so powerful, the thing that is keeping us from going to war is that we know it would be the end of life as we presently know it. That is a grim, 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 grim state of affairs for those that were made in the image of God to procreate, to grow, to praise, and to fill the earth. 
Birds are unaware of World War I, World War II, and the impending potential of World War III. As are the fish in the oceans and, and the, 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 the animals that, that roam the wilds of the African savanna. But we are aware. We are uniquely capable, says Wright, of actually jettisoning our creational intent and saying, you know what, I'm not going to live for the great you, for the great G, capital G God. I'm going to live for the little G God, me. I'm going to put myself and my desires and my ambitions at the heart of this thing called life. And I love this. Wright says, all of this, when the psalmist looks out at the world, he sees all of creation echoing a great shout of praise to the God who made it to flourish. What looks to the flattened out imagination of late Western modernity like lifeless matter is in fact a world, I love this, throbbing with God-given life. That life is constantly praising its maker by being particularly and peculiarly, that's hard to say, peculiarly what it is. This is what I was referencing when I said Judith being Judith and Ruth being Ruth and David being David and Elizabeth being Elizabeth. God has called you to fulfill your creational and, and praise intents, praise giving intent, no more than he has the beautiful birds. No less, in fact, greater than he has because you are an image bearer. A psalm-shaped world, I'll just, I'm sorry to just put such a fine point on it, but a psalm-shaped world is not going to be terribly fascinated by political parties and talk radio. This stuff is poisonous. It, it, every now and then I'll, I'll find myself in a store somewhere or, or it'll come up on, you know, some, some friend will have it on or it'll come up on, you know, a, a YouTube channel or something and I'll hear the, 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 the vicious and volatile and serrated language, particularly in the increasingly polarized world of American politics. And Australia is not far behind. And I don't want to tell you how to live your life, but I just want to say if, if you love that stuff and you like to dig into the nitty-gritty of he said, she said, and the liberal and the labor and the Republican and the Democrat and the pro-Trump and the anti-Trump, I just want to tell you that's not a psalm-shaped world. That is the most insular, frankly discouraging, disgusting, grotesque world that you could be paying attention to. It's people going mad for power and then saying that nobody, saying that we're the good guys and they're all the bad guys. I got news for you. They're all bad guys because they're all sinners in need of a savior. And if you were given charge of the country, you would do no better. In the psalm-shaped world, it's a world where the things of nature and the things of praise and the things of scripture and the things of God have more interest and more of our attention than all of this gobbledygook and poppycock that the world throws at us clamoring for your attention, clamoring for your loyalty, and it's filth. You'll, you'll be changed into the thing that you behold. And I tell you, it has been a fascinating thing to see how American politics and American culture has been shaped in the post-Trump world. Because the people are still the same people, but, but now they just, these lines are so strong and the tones are so strident and the talk shows are so perverse and, and yet I see sometimes my own church members, not so much in this church, but when I travel overseas, though there are a few here that love to get involved in it as well, they say, hey, did you hear? Hey, did you? No, I didn't. No, I didn't, and I don't care. I, I, I have zero time. I have a king. I have a king. I have a president. I have a parliament. Okay, and I don't have a second of my life to spend on people fighting over a little speck of dust that's going to be reconfigured into God's great image in a few short years anyway. Man, I got a psalm-shaped world. I want a psalm-shaped worldview, and that's not informed by BBC or CNN. And I'm not suggesting that you can't learn some things from this, but especially these, these strident tones. I just urge you, just... Don't be of the world. You can be in it, but not of it. God wants our praise to ascend, as we've said, marked with our own individuality. And when we become distracted by other things, we miss out. Unlike the simple birds and the simple animals of the forest, we who give praise to God and they're unaware that Donald Trump is president, we miss the mark. We should have the highest ability and the greatest capacity to praise God, and we miss it. The only species that is apparently capable of not fulfilling our creational destiny.
Ah, what a sad story that is. So my advice to you is to go outside. Turn off the television, turn off the radio, go outside, move, walk, see, smell, camp, climb, cycle, bird, fish, surf, swim, run, and praise. Your life will be better. In fact, study after study after study after study consistently confirms you will be psychologically more healthy if you get exercise in the out of doors. Go sleep on the dirt. Go camping. Go, go drink some water out of a stream, a safe stream. You might have to filter it. Get up early in the morning and watch the sunrise. Go watch the whales migrate off the coast. Spend some time as the sun rises with scripture open. Tune out the world, the clamoring, ever clamoring world of politics and sports and, and ubiquitous entertainment. There is a place for it, a very small place for it. And turn up the world of creation. Turn up the world that's in obedience to God. Not this world that's in disobedience. And finally, the God with power to provide. I don't know if you notice this or not, but if you go back through the psalm, the whole psalm, again, is so theocentric. It's all about God. God is the great sun, the one around which we orbit in praise. And if you, if you count carefully the verbs that are associated with God, God is said to do 10 things in this psalm. The psalmist, he's falling over himself with increasingly beautiful and poetic language to say, God, you did, and you do, and you did, and you do, and you did, and you do. You forgive, you choose, you answer, you call forth songs of joy, you care, you enrich, you ordain, you drench, you soften, you crown. That's a psalm-shaped world. A psalm-shaped world is oriented to God as the flower orients to the rising sun. A psalm-shaped world is oriented to God's goodness. And I tell you, I tell you, I tell you. We live in a time when for various reasons, people find it easy to focus on the negative. And uh, I sometimes, in my pastoral capacity, though thank you, Jesus, not as much as you might imagine, I sometimes have to deal with people that see or perceive negative things happening in the church. And I'm not suggesting that this doesn't occasionally happen. But I tell you, it takes a certain kind of skill. It takes a certain kind of artistic creativity to note the negatives in light of all the amazing positives that are happening. If you have that skill, I want to invite you to unlearn it. See if you can become less good, less creative at noticing what he said or she said or what they didn't do or how things could be better or things could be different. I'm sure that your mother taught you as my mother taught me that if you can't say something... Don't say something. In the little book, Steps to Christ, one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Ellen White, tells a story. She says in, in this story, she was in a dream, and in this dream, she was walking through a garden, and she said there were all of these beautiful flowers in a perfectly manicured garden. This was a dream she had, and, and she saw roses, and she saw lilies, and she saw pinks, and she saw pansies, and saw all of these beautiful flowers, but a friend of hers was just a few steps behind and was complaining, oh, look at the thistles, look at the thorns, look at all... And, and of course, the thistles were there, and the thorns were there. There were things to notice, but why notice them? When the paisies are there, and the roses are there, and the flowers are there, and the smells are there. Friends, some of us have honed to a fine skill the ability to find the negative, even though we are surrounded by positives. Make it an effort. Make it a goal. Make it a drive to try and see the good wherever there is good to be seen. I was just talking this week with a good friend of mine, a good friend of many of yours too, Josh Cunningham, and he said he's been meditating on, on Philippians 4, verse 8. Whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things, all of that beautiful, think on these things. And, and, and Josh said something to me that was really mind-blowing. He said, you know, David, I used to read that verse, and I used to think that this wasn't actually saying what it was saying. It was actually implicitly telling us all the stuff we shouldn't be thinking about. Don't think about evil stuff. Don't think, some of the stuff I was just saying a moment ago, you know, all these political debates and, you know, rated R movies and all that. And he said, I actually think it's a little different now. He said, I'm not suggesting that, that there's not a sort of secondary application where the, the verse is saying not to concentrate on those things. But he said, I think what the verse is saying is find good wherever you can. Find good wherever you can. Now, some of you can do that with some skill, but this is the harder thing. Find good in whoever you can. Find good in whoever you can. 
Some people are toxic. Some people should not be trusted. They can be loved. They can be forgiven. They should not be trusted. Don't be one of those people. Don't be a toxic person. Don't be a person without a psalm-shaped worldview. Don't, don't be a person who has honed the fine craft of seeing the negative in everyone. Look to somebody and say, yes, I don't like, I don't. There are a few thorns, there are a few thistles, but look at the posies and look at the pinks and look at the roses. Try to find the good and when you learn, when you begin to hone that skill, and, and maybe you weren't trained this way, maybe your own parents conditioned you uh, to, to not see this, but when you begin to hone the skill of seeing the good in others and, and seeing the fact that, that all creation has the capacity to bear the image of God, you'll become a better version of yourself. You'll become a better version of yourself. There are particular church members in here right now that I'd love to just give a big shout out to. Just, just a big shout out to church members who just do such a good job of inclusivity and of building up and of crossing social and generational lines. And, and uh, there are many here. So that's why I don't want to do it because I would be saying some and leaving out others. And, and I, just, I just love that God has raised up what we might call catalysts to make the church this beautiful, focused on God, a psalm-shaped world, this, this corporate entity, and I just want to plead with you to be that person. Church is what we make it, and church is the way we treat one another, and church is the way that we love one another. We look to God who enriches, who ordains, who drenches, who softens, who crowns. I love this in Romans 1, 21. Speaking of the heart of pagan philosophy, it says that the pagans did not glorify God, and they were not thankful what a fascinating thing to say about paganism gone wild. They weren't thankful. Oh, they were idolatrous. Oh, they were sexually perverse. Oh, all of that is true. But Paul's chief critique of paganism is that they weren't thankful. That they didn't have gratitude and thanksgiving as the natural outflowing of their lives. Your greatest duty, friend, and your greatest joy are the same thing, to glorify God. And you glorify God by just looking around you and saying, man, I've got calcium ions racing through my body right now that are enabling me to live and speak and think and eat. I have so much to be thankful for. The things that we know number in the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands, the things that we don't know that we have to be thankful for number in the many millions. Neither were thankful an unthankful heart is a darkened and a sinful heart, and an unthankful heart is not a, a psalm-shaped heart, and it will not produce a psalm-shaped world. John Chrysostom, in his uh, early church father, very early church father, fourth century, said, he who enjoys something without thanksgiving is like robbing God. You enjoy that mango, you enjoy that song, you enjoy that sexual intercourse with your spouse, you enjoy that movie, you enjoy that thing that you enjoy. And he says, if you enjoy that thing and your heart doesn't erupt in thanksgiving, erupt in praise to God, he says, you've robbed God. Because God is the source of that joy. God is the source of that pleasure. God is the source of that happiness. Don't rob God of the praise that is his. When God comes to warm his hands at your heart, may he not find negative and criticism, negativity and criticism there. May his hands be warmed as you fulfill increasingly and better and better every day your creational purpose. Luke 17, 17, Jesus has just healed 10 lepers. One comes back, and Jesus answered, and tell me if you can't read between the lines there. Tell me if you can't see a little pain there in the heart of Jesus. Were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Tell me that you can't see that Jesus wanted to warm his hands, not only at the one, but at the two, and the three, and the four, and the five, and the six, seven, eight, and the nine. That God's heart was pained. That so many had a reason to be thankful, but only one gave the praise. Only one offered thanksgiving. Only one came back to thank. All creation is praising and glorifying and thanking God. So why wouldn't you? Can somebody say amen? Well, why wouldn't you? Are you the one or are you the nine? We wrap this up. Sam Harris, at the close of his TED Talk, he said, man, we got to be careful with this artificial intelligence 
50 years isn't 50 years anymore. What used to be 50 years in terms of technological advancement is now 50 months. And what used to be 50 months is now five months. And what used to be five months is now five days. We are on the cusp, says Harris, of creating machines that are so technologically advanced and computer programs that are so technologically advanced that they can become a threat to the very way that we do life. And he closed that TED Talk again with saying, this is the time to admit that we're in the process of building some sort of God and we'd better figure out, is this God that we're in the process of building a God that we can live with? With all due respect to Mr. Harris, who was an eminently intelligent man, I say never mind the imagined and false gods that we think we could live with. What you should be paying attention to and orienting yourself to is the one true God, the Redeemer, the Creator, and the Provider, who is a God that you literally cannot live without. This is a God you can no longer afford to live without. And so I appeal to you as your pastor, I appeal to you as a fellow traveler, I appeal to you as your friend, insist, insist on having a God shaped, excuse me, a psalm shaped world. A world where the way that you view the world is through the lens of the psalms orbiting around the great big you and you in a flow of creational praise. You. It's not just for somebody else and not just for the person on your right and on your left, but you are praising God. You are thanking God. Whether it's with singing or whether it's with praying or whether it's with service or whether it's with ministry, whatever it is. Don't miss out on the opportunity to fulfill God's creational intent in your life and say, God, teach me how to have and how to live a psalm-shaped reality. Can somebody say amen? amen? Come on. Father in heaven, teach us, teach us how to be thankful. Teach us how to praise Teach us how to rejoice. Teach us how to overflow with love for you and for those around us. Father, forgive us where we have, some of us, many of us, become practiced in the art, the dark art of criticism and negativity. Father, forgive us where we have become practiced and very skilled in the ability to see others' faults and frailties and fragilities. Father, help us to see that we are all sinners in need of grace that you are the God of the ends of the earth and the far distant islands. And when we are overwhelmed by sin, you comfort, you save, and you forgive. Father, you are redeemer, you are creator, and you are provider. We turn as the flower turns to you. We orient to you. And we pray that you would teach us how to have a life that orbits around you. The life of David, a psalm-shaped life, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen.